So we actually didn't quite finish population models last week in the classroom. Um, we came very close though. I'm going to present one more thing. And this is fine because it's going to feed right into the rest of the material we want to talk about today, which is fixed points. So what the textbook calls the extinction or the doomsday model. So a lot of animals have quite uh quite arbitrary seeming mating rituals. I mean, you know why um, a female bird should select a mate based on the color of that mate's plumage is probably kind of obscure um, to us. But animals cannot rely on random chance for procreation to occur. So even if it seems strange, there has to be something like that. Or at least that's what's indicated by the mathematics. Let's look at a situation where there are no mating rituals, no Ears budding heads, no peacocks and their feathers, just procreation will occur due to a chance interact but we in male and female animal was so let's look at the number of births in a small time interval. And let's just do this as a problem of probability. Let's assume that there are an equal number of male and female animals. If the total population is P, P over two of them are male, P over two of them are female. We're looking at the adult members of the species that are capable of reproduction. So there are P over two times P over two possible ways that a male and a female can interact. And now we can just start throwing in constants, probability constants. So that's that K1 be the probability that an interaction occurs. So K1 times P over two times P over two is the total number of interactions that occur. Then we can have K2, the probability that an interaction uh, results in pregnancy. And we could then, I mean, we could have K3, the number of children or offspring that will result from the average pregnancy. 
And this should be the number of new animals that are born as a result of mating between male and female animals during a small time interval. And all of these Ks and both of those one halves can be subsumed into a single constant, alpha times P squared. So the number of births in a small time interval or will be alpha times p squared. I mean, for simplicity, we're just assuming that birth is an immediate process, which it obviously isn't, but Let's run with this. The number of births will be alpha times p squared. The number of births is always the birth rate times p. So because these are both the number of births, they must be equal to one another. Alpha times P times P must equal beta times P. At beta times p is what I said, obviously not what I wrote. And that means that the birth rate in this model should be alpha times p. We will keep the death rate fixed and we'll take this birth rate and plug it into the general population model. And here is the differential equation modeling this situation. And this looks kind of similar to the logistic model, if you go back through your notes and find the logistic model, wait. sorry, I changed my parameter on the board. I'm using alpha, I'm using K in my notes. That should now be correct. So as I say, this is very similar looking to the logistic model, but the subtraction is flipped. In the logistic model, the P is on the right and the constant's on the left. Here, the P is on the left and the constant is on the right. So this is kind of a thick version of the logistic model. And I am not going to solve this thing. I mean, we could do separation of variables and all of that nonsense. But instead, I'm once again going to just look at fixed points. And that's going to lead us right into this section, which is all about fixed points. So let's remind ourselves what a fixed point is in this specific context. DP dt is a derivative. It's the rate 
the population changes. So if dp, dt were negative, that tells you the population is declining. If dp dt equal to zero, that would tell you the population is fixed. It's unchanging. And if dp dt were positive, That would tell you that the population is increasing. And this model over here has the property. We'll give a name to it in a bit in the next section. But this model has the property that dp dt only depends on D. So that's not to say that time is irrelevant in this model, because P depends on time. The population changes as time changes. But if you want to know whether that derivative is negative or positive or zero, all you need to know is the current population. If you know what the current population is, that tells you whether the population is increasing or decreasing or not changing. For the population to be fixed, for the population not to change, requires something quite special to happen. The derivative is alpha p, times p minus delta over alpha for the population not to be changing that derivative must be zero and there are only two ways this product can equal zero the zero product property tells us this if we're multiplying things together and we're getting zero, then one of the things we're multiplying has to be zero. So alpha P has to be zero. Divide both sides by alpha. And that becomes P equals zero. Or P minus delta over alpha has to equal zero, which if we add to both sides, gives you that P is delta over alpha. So there are two ways this population might not be changing. There are two values of the population. And one of them makes intuitive sense, that population equals zero. If the population equals zero, then the animal population is extinct. And of course, it's no longer changing. 
this other number, delta over alpha, doesn't have any obvious meaning necessarily. But if you look back through your notes, the logistic model had something like this as well. In the logistic model, we had a carrying capacity. The number of animals who could be healthily supported by a population. And I'm putting a question mark next to carrying capacity here because it's not totally clear that this is the same thing. But that's what it meant in the logistic model anyway. When is the population increasing? Well, the population is increasing when the derivative is greater than zero. We have to be careful messing around with inequality. We know that if we divided both sides of an inequality by a negative number, for example, that would flip the inequality. But we but alpha is a positive constant, and we cannot have a negative number of animals meaning that alpha times P is positive. And we can divide both sides by alpha times P, and that inequality will retain its direction. The right-hand side will still be the left-hand side. Well, zero divided by anything is zero. So the population is increasing when it's large. And I guess that might make an intuitive amount of sense. If there are a lot of animals, there are a lot of births going on. The birth rate beats the death rate, so the population increases. If we ask when the population is decreasing, well, it's decreasing when when the derivative's negative. We can again divide both sides by alpha p. And we find that the population is decreasing if the population is small. And again, that makes a certain amount of naive sense. If the population is small, then there aren't a lot of births. So the death rate will beat the birth rate and the animal population will decline. But although that might sort of make intuitive sense, think what this means for the population 
as time passes. We've got two values for the population would just sit still forever To the right of that value, the population is increasing. To the left of that value, the population is decreasing. So this model is actually telling you something extremely bad. It tells you that if the population gets below this value, delta over k, there's no hope for it. There's no way it can rebound because, well, because once it gets below that number, it's always decreasing and it will therefore decrease until the animals become extinct. If the animal population ever gets large, we're in the situation that the book calls Doomsday. And what we're going to see in Doomsday is the animal population explode up to infinity. As a matter of fact, I believe it explodes up to infinity in a finite amount of time. I think you saw that in one of your homework exercises. And that's not good either. I mean, if one animal population is allowed to just grow without bound, it's going to destroy the ecosystem. I mean, we see that with deer, you know, we came in and we killed off their natural predators, and now we have to artificially cull deer with hunting and so on. Otherwise, the population would just explode and they destroy everything. So neither of these situations is a good situation. Either the animal is going to just become extinct, or it's going to be so prolific that it takes over the ecosystem entirely. And you might say, well, but there's a saving grace here, right? We can just, we can just sit there forever. And this is where we get to the notion of stability. I mean, suppose that that number is 5,000. And this model is telling you that if there are 5,000 animals, there will always be 5,000 animals. And they won't go extinct, and they won't destroy the ecosystem. It will just always sit there at exactly 5,000. Well, that's not... I mean, what's this real world animal population where the number of animals literally never changes? In the real world, I mean, the model says that will happen. In the real world, it clearly won't. The first time this animal population is hit by a disease, and driven below 5,000, this model claims it will go extinct. Or the first time there's a particularly luscious spring and the animals have a bunch of resources and thrive and the animal population grows above 5,000, 
We're in the doomsday situation, and the animal will, will destroy the ecosystem. So mathematically, it's true we sit here forever, but we know in any kind of real world situations, there are things not in the model that are taking our population and shaking it around. So mathematically, there can always be 5,000 animals, but that's not something you could see in the real world. Now let's compare this to the logistic model. The logistic model had this extinction and this is it delta. Sorry, as I said, I went with alpha on the whiteboard and have been regretting it ever since because it's not what's in my notes. Um. So in the logistic model. That was a zero. That was the initial birth rate minus the death rate over a growth rate. And in the logistic model, these arrows are reversed. If the population is small, then the population grows. And if the population is big, then the population shrinks. And again, that might seem unintuitive, but it's what the logistic model predicts. And now, look at this value, the carrying capacity. Again, say that it's 5,000. The model claims that if there are 5,000 animals, there are always exactly 5,000 animals. The derivative is zero. It doesn't change. Well, again, we know that's not realistic. We know that there are re this model doesn't account for unexpected diseases. This model doesn't count for unexpected windfalls. This model doesn't account for mass accidents. If there's a forest fire, this model won't account for it. If a wolf pack moves in, this model won't account for it. The reality is that there are all sorts of things that happen in the real world that aren't in this model. So what happens when one of those real world situations strikes? There's a harsh winter and a bunch of animals are killed off unexpectedly. Well, in this model, that's okay. Up here, if a bunch of animals died unexpectedly, it would lead to the extinction of the species. Down here, if a bunch of animals die unexpectedly, they'll just rebound up until they reach that number again. Or again, there's an unusually gentle winter and the population manages to get a bit above 5,000. Well, up here, if the population grew above 5,000, it would cause a catastrophe. The population would go to infinity. Down here, it's no big deal if the population manages to get above 5,000. It just follows the arrows and shrinks. So that's, well, that's a few things, in fact. It's the extinction and doomsday model. 
And it's also an introduction to the idea of fixed points and stability. That is the next section.